Hello, everybody joining us today around the world, and welcome to our Distinguished Lecturer webinar series. Before we go any further, my name is Kerry Cosby, and I'm the Chapters Manager here at the IEEE Computer Society. I oversee more than 500 professional and student chapters around the world and manage our Distinguished Visitors Program. Before we get started, I'd like to get a couple of housekeeping tasks out of the way. You can ask your questions in the Q&A panel. Dr. Sriram will answer as many questions as he can following this presentation. The webinar is being recorded and the slides and recording will be made available after the webinar. Today's lecture is Transforming Healthcare Through AI Revolutions. The webinar is co-sponsored by the Special Technical Community on IT and Practice. I'd like to introduce our speaker. Ram Sriram is currently the Chief of the Software and Systems Division Information Technology Laboratory at the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Dr. Sriram has co-authored or authored more than 275 publications, including several books. Dr. Sriram was a founding co-editor of the International Journal for AI and Engineering. Dr. Sriram, I'd like to pass the floor to you. Uh, thank you very much, Kerry. And again, uh... Good morning to the people from West Coast. Uh, good afternoon to people from Middle and East Coast and good evening to the rest of the world. So my talk today is uh, transforming healthcare through AI revolutions. I have a lot of slides here and I won't be going through all of them, uh, skipping a few of them on the way, but as Kerry mentioned, uh, those of you who have registered for this particular uh, meeting, will get a copy of the slides uh, right after the seminar. And uh, so what I'm gonna do is to talk about a brief history of artificial intelligence, talk about uh, what my organization's organization, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, does with AI. Then I'll uh, talk about a few facts about the healthcare and AI. Then I'm gonna talk about three waves of, uh, of, of AI with respect to the medical domain. Um, I'll also briefly talk about the DARPA XAI uh, project our program, and then we'll do the summary after that. So if you look at artificial intelligence as such, uh, I don't wanna go into definitions of AI, except that uh, this, is, uh, uh, this, this is an attempt to make computers intelligent and have the same reasoning capacity capabilities as human beings. So there's a, a whole history associated with it, and I start with something called the prehistory. And I just use these words, paleotic and neolithic. And, uh, they don't really mean much, but uh, let me, it, it's just the world and the new kind of thing. So if you look carefully at the Indian and the Greek philosophers uh, and the philosophies, they really talked about uh, uh, the notion of how human beings think. They talked about the notion of knowledge, notion of how knowledge is represented in terms of ontologies. And they talked about inference. And for those who are, um, listening to this from the Indian subcontinent, you know that uh, the Indian philosophies talk about uh, things such as, uh, not only in terms of ontologies, but things such as inference, like anumana. So those kinds of things have already been dealt with the philosophers at that time. And similarly, Aristotle and other people have talked about logics. So you, you can see the origins there. Then you have Hume, Russell, Turing, Kant, and a number of other philosophers have been talking about, again, uh, uh, the machines uh, of, 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 of the human intelligence and uh, discussions regarding that. Then there was the beginning, which was 1956, where the word AI was coined at Dartmouth Conference. And here, uh, you know, we have many stalwarts like uh, McCarthy, uh, Minsky, and other folks who attended the conference and coined this term called AI. Uh, as far uh, in terms of the early years, uh, around uh, starting about 1957 to 1980, uh, the number of advances which have been made, like uh, the general problem solver at uh, CMU, Dendrel at Stanford, again, hearsay speech understanding system at CMU, Maxima, which has its origins at MIT, uh, Mycene at Stanford, Stanford, and Shaky the Robot uh, at, uh, at, at Stanford, and so on. So these are the early years, and there was a rise of what are known as the knowledge-based systems. And uh, these kind of turn into something called knowledge is power, and Edward Feigenbaum at Stanford wrote a, uh, was, uh, wrote a very nice book on that uh, it's, uh, in the early 80s. And also, and this is where the expert systems were in, uh, 
became very popular, and I'll talk briefly about that later on. Uh, there was also some work on uh, early neural networks, and uh, in fact, one of the Turing Award winners, Jeff Winton, was at CMU at that time working on, on neural networks. This was the very early stage of neural networks. Then we had what is known as a silent period, uh, that is from 1990 to 2000, uh, where you had a lot of activity going on in AI, but there's not much press and so on, but still things were going on. Uh, there was a deep blue system. Is a, uh, this IBM system would be, be the, uh, the world champions in the game. There's a rise of robots, commercialization of AI technologies, especially speech understanding. And many of you might have actually dealt with things like uh, uh, naturally speaking Dragon, uh, which actually had its origins at Carnegie Mellon University. Then uh, there has, uh, you know, following Moore's law, the systems, the hardware also was becoming cheaper and you can uh, have uh, increased amount of hardware power. You have GPUs, CPUs, and all kinds of things. So neural networks came to the fore and we call it as the second revolution or the second wave. I'm gonna use waves and revolutions interchangeably around here. And one of the things that happened in the second revolution is the deep learning. We'll come back to that later on. Uh, then uh, again, uh, from starting 2015 to 2015, 25, I think, in the next 10 years, a few more years, we have uh, explainable AI, open knowledge networks, and so on, and we'll again talk about it later on, and we call it as the third revolution or the third wave. Uh, then we finally have the conscience machine, uh, which is uh, which I call the fourth wave, and uh, can AI attain uh, consciousness is the thing, and here is a nice book by Susan on... Uh, book is entitled Artificial You, but it talks about the notion of consciousness. And, so on. and also uh, in the February uh, AAAI conference, Henry Cox, who's currently at National Science Foundation, he gave a very, very nice talk on the history of AI, and uh, you can probably Google Henry Cox and you can get the his, his, his slides. And I'll also put that uh, URL in my slide set. So briefly talk about uh, my organization, NIST. Uh, NIST is a uh, federal government organization. Uh, belong, it, it is under the Department of Commerce, and also it's in the United States uh, uh, Constitution, uh, I believe Article 1, Section 8, uh, where uh, you know, we talk about standards and measures. So the main purpose of our organization is to promote U.S. innovation and industrial competitiveness by advancing measurement science, standards, and technology. So the key thing is measurements, standards, and technology. And the idea is to enhance the economic security and improve the quality of life in the United States. So in terms of AI, there is AI for NIST and NIST for AI. That is, how can artificial intelligence be used for some of the metrology or measurement activities that NIST undertakes? And then what can NIST do itself in terms of measurements for artificial intelligence? So these are the two things, again, keep in mind, AI for NIST and NIST for AI. So if you look at it, we have a number of activities going on, research, application, deployment, investigation. And the key thing that we are trying to achieve here is trustworthiness in AI. How do you trust these AI systems? So associated with that, uh, we have uh, things like privacy, safety, resilience, reliability, and so on. Uh, so, yeah. And in terms of uh, using artificial intelligence for NIST, we use it in a number of applications like IoT, robotics, material science, smart manufacturing, biomedical imaging. And NIST has a track record, a track record in doing these evaluations. As some of you who are familiar with speech understanding know this, uh, there was uh, NIST used to do a lot of stuff in measuring the speech systems. And this is old report from the 1990s called uh, the DARPA TIMIT program. So you can you can get you can get access to that. There's also the Trek program, which is for uh, uh, which is an experiment and evaluation in information retrieval. And the NIST has this uh, yearly experiments where uh, the programs which access information on the web uh, are uh, not really evaluated; they're tested in a way. Okay? So that's a brief introduction to uh, our history. And uh, in about uh, 2019. Uh, the, uh, there was a presidential order, which is the American AI Initiative. And as you can see in that uh, part three there, that uh, you can uh, see that uh, the initiative calls for NIST to lead the development of appropriate technical standards 
for reliable, robust, trustworthy, secure, portable, and interoperable AI systems. And uh, in a record amount of time, uh, NIST produced a plan on the US leadership in AI, and uh, Elam uh, Tabasi led the NIST program here, and you can see there's a website where you can get this document. And the program really talked about uh, three major areas of AI and standards, what are the priorities and what recommendation in terms of how the recommendations for the federal engagement. They talked about the needs and challenges, they talked about United States government activity in AI standards, and the federal engagement. So a nice report that uh, I suggest that you should read. And we have a number of activities going on at NIST, and there's a website there, uh, which is www.nist.gov slash topic slash artificial intelligence. And it tells you a lot of things of activities which are going in NIST. It's, it's a lot more than what I'm gonna talk about. And NIST is very, very, uh, we have some leading experts who are working on a number of very interesting topics, and depending on your area, you can find uh, uh, some topic of interest for you. Okay, now I'm going to uh, keep that aside and come back to the main topic, that is healthcare. And I'm also a program manager for the NIST Health IT program. So uh, I'm wearing that hat now, I'm gonna talk about it. Uh, for, I'll briefly talk about uh, some of the facts in healthcare, uh, a vision, what could be the future healthcare. Then I'm gonna introduce something called, it's known by P7 or P9 medicine, talk a little bit about healthcare infrastructure and uh, something to do with uh, the electronic health records here, and we'll talk about uh, towards AI-based healthcare. So in terms of the facts, healthcare in the United States is a $3.5 trillion uh, was spent in 2017, and it's much more now. And we're talking about three years ago. These facts are three, or three years old. So you can see it's probably $4 trillion now. So there are statements in the press that uh, about $750 billion is lost to the inefficiencies in the system. And one of the statements with some reports said that you can save really about $200 billion by effective use of artificial intelligence. I'm sorry, of information technology. And there are multiple activity, uh, parties which are playing different roles in the solar ecosystem. Now, there are a number of people here from India, and I believe Indian GDP is around maybe $3 trillion now. So United States here, we spend more than the GDP of many countries. So this particular slide shows you where the money comes from. And then the next slide shows you where the money goes on. It's not very clear, but then once you get the slide set, you can see uh, actually only 20% of the money is really paid to the doctors. The rest of the thing, money goes to various other places. So in other words, like 20% is about uh, 700 to $800 billion goes to the physicians and rest of it goes to a number of hospitals, medical devices and other things. So here, yeah, briefly, I'll talk about something to do with uh, the levels of biological information. We go from ecologies all the way to uh, MNA and D mRNA and DNA level. Ecologies are at the highest level, and these are different levels of abstraction because these ecologies have societies. Societies have individuals like you and me, and we have our organs. Organs consist of tissues. Tissues have cells, and uh, then the cells, uh, um, in cells, there are a number of activities going on. Uh, which are controlled by the protein and gene networks, and there are protein, there are protein, protein interaction networks, and we have proteins which participate in this protein, protein interactions. Then we have the messenger RNAs and DNA at the lowest level, and then you can go at the atomic level. But I'm not going that. Level. So the healthcare activities, for example, at NIST, kind of focus on that particular level, and we have a whole program on uh, uh, the uh, biosciences which goes from the tissues to the DNA level. And I'm not gonna talk about all the healthcare activities which go on is because we have many different labs uh, working on different aspects, like a manufacturing measurement lab. They do a lot of work uh, in terms of testing, in vivo, uh, sorry, in vitro, and so on. So they do all these uh, things and we work very closely with them. And I'll come through some examples uh, later on. And in terms of the health IT, we can span a number of these things, of applying health information technology to these things. Uh, here is another slide which, which goes from the lowest level, DNA level, to the organism behavior. And uh, this is, uh, and, each, and, and, and there's this whole notion called omics. And again, uh, om, om is a word which is used quite a lot in uh, yoga and other places, and om actually means an integrated whole. So this is according to Atul Bhatt, uh, who used to be at Stanford University. So all these omics are really integrated uh, 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 systems, you know, actually, actually in involves a lot more than a single unit. 
So we have uh, genomics, trans transcriptomics, proteomics, uh, metabolics, semiomics, and finally we have the organism behavior. So it's interesting to note how this small thing called a DNA expresses itself in a behavior of an organism. Uh, there's a lot of fields which are feeding into this whole notion of systems medicine, as you can see, proteomics, genomics, bioanalysis, computer science, and engineering. I won't go into too much details in that, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, making the future health uh, vision attainable, we have a number of tracks here. One is the advances in healthcare technology, where you can see the human genome project and work in pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals, medical devices. And the second thread in terms of advances in healthcare practice, disease management, evidence-based healthcare, continuum of care. There's something called the mind-body medicine, which again is becoming very popular because human being is not a single dimension. So you have three dimensions in there. You have the social dimension, and we human beings are social beings. Actually, it's kind of interesting nowadays with the COVID-19, they talk about social distancing. Actually, that should be physical distancing and not social distancing. We like to interact socially, whether through the web or not. So then there is, then we have this notion of uh, psychological uh, things that we go on in terms of more of a cognitive things. And finally, uh, we have the physiological things uh, in the, happening in the body, the three dimensions. Like for people who are under stress, there's a whole pathway, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal gland pathway, which is the uh, physiological thing that goes on, stress hormones are released. and But we also have the psychological one where uh, uh, we can do some meditation. That's what the new Seek article says, mind-body thing in terms of meditation. We can actually control stress. Finally, we have the social interactions we have either in your churches or temples or mosques. You go and interact with people there, and that's also when there's a tragedy occurs in your family. You have a lot of people coming together, and all these are very important to reduce the stress level and reduce the corticosteroids in your body. So, cortisol, sorry, in your body. So, so and then there is a third track that also is going on, and the third track is the advances in computing, imaging, and information technology. As you have seen, what is happening in the web, in the, uh, in the, on, the on the web, the internet, uh, cloud, data analytics. And I believe there is going to be a workshop on data analytics sometime end of this month from IEEE. So then you have this uh, speed and storage. All these are uh, speed is increasing, and you have, uh, as you know, the storage. What is happening to that in terms of uh, terabytes of uh, a store space story uh, of uh, information is being compressed and put it on small uh, microchips. Uh, you have networking, communications, and imaging technologies, and then you have seen. Uh, uh, these things called NPCD. Those are mobile personal computing devices, uh, like the one, I don't know if you can see it or not, the one I'm holding in, in the hand. Uh, it's like a, it looks like an iPhone, I guess, and that's an iPhone, but I use it more for doing other things than, I, than talking on the phone. So we do texting, Gmail, everything. And these things are becoming powerful devices in the medical world because you've got kind of all kind of medical software built into those things, uh, including some AI software, uh, measuring your blood pressure, me measuring your vitals, and so on, okay? So that's what the future health vision is. And, there, and then I'm briefly introduced this thing called uh, P7 and P9 concept. Uh, and this is what, again, the future of medicine is gonna be, uh, gonna be personalized, uh, where, uh, it, it, where the individual, where you, t where you ta tailor things to the individual, uh, predictive, uh, whereas based on the information uh, in both the electronic health records and your genomic data, uh, we should be able to determine an individual susceptibility to a particular disease. We are precise, but then we are participatory, where uh, you want the individual uh, to participate in, in, uh, in his or her health care. Uh, preventive, you want to prevent, instead of actually treating the disease, you want to anticipate what the disease is going to be and prevent. And actually, the recent COVID-19 is a good example for that uh, in terms of trying to uh, predict uh, how the disease is going to spread and taking measures so that we can prevent it. And in terms of the precise, and once you have this data and information are gathered, then you have decision analytic tools that can be used to precisely determine the cause of a disease and appropriate uh, recommendations can be made or the therapeutic actions. Uh, pervasive uh, means that you want it at the, uh, uh, the you, you should be able to treat patient anywhere. Uh, including the homes. And that is what you're seeing nowadays. You can see now in terms of telemedicine. In the future, you'll have these medical devices on you, which are intelligently monitoring your sugar levels. And they're all, and then putting in the appropriate levels of insulin, uh, for, for insulin or appropriate uh, medicine into your body. 
But then we have the seventh part of it, which is privacy, because a lot of information is generated, and you have to make sure that this information is protected appropriately, which comes to the protection part of it. Uh, it's not only, and here we, we talk about the safety. You've got to protect the person from malfunctioning devices, potentially. You've got to protect from, uh, from misuse of electronic health records. So you've got to protect the patient. Finally, price plays a big role because medicine cannot, the way we cannot really man manage to go ahead uh, with uh, exponential costs increasing. Uh, so we have to somehow manage this price. Okay. So this is some of the health IT networks around here. We have a lot of people, hospitals, radiology, EHRs, and so on, and they're all participating in this health IT. Uh, there was a report uh, procuring interoperability by the National Academy of Medicine, which is there, and they have a set of nice slides on uh, uh, medicine at different levels of abstraction, like you have the micro tier, which is at the point of care, either at your homes or in the hospitals, uh, operating rooms. Then you have this individual uh, hospitals or uh, the medical officers. Then you have networks of these hospitals. So that is a macro tier. So you have a micro tier, miso tier, and macro tier. And you can see at each one of these tiers, AI plays a major role in terms of decision making. And not only that, there is information and, and data which are being generated and passed across the, within intra and intra levels out there. So this is a concept that we came up with called the smart network systems and sort of societies. I'm not gonna go in very much detail except uh, state that uh, we have uh, this whole notion of internet of things and cyber physical systems, uh, which will be part of your ecosystem. And then uh, we have uh, the social networks also. So com combining the social networks along with the internet of things and cyber physical systems, we are going to have this future smart network systems and societies, which will use all the ingredients I talked about in the future of healthcare vision. Uh, now, within this uh, system, uh, people use what are known as, in the United States especially, the electronic health records. Uh, in terms of the electronic health records, there are a number of things. First of all, the doctor has to put input information into the system. Like the patient goes to the doctor and the doctor has to input all the information that he or she gathers from the patient. There's a big problem with that nowadays because a lot of times the doctors are spending more time on the keyboard rather with the patients. So you can, one can, end, and also the user interface is not very clean. There are buttons in the wrong place and this can lead to some adverse actions uh, as such. So there's an important part in terms of R&D. Uh, you, can, you can develop intelligent user inter interfaces based on AI technologies. Uh, then the, once you have all the data that you gather, the history, physical, uh, lab data, all kinds of data which comes in, then uh, the radiological data, as you have seen, this needs to be stored. And we are talking about representation and persistency because the information has to be stored in a particular way. And it has to be, and typically we think that people live around 70 to 80 years around here. So the, the medical records have to be kept in place uh, over this period of time. Now, for many of you, uh, especially people uh, from 1970s like me, we actually seen that uh, the storage mechanisms have changed over the years. Like I used to use uh, these uh, punch cards and now who knows where the storage is, somewhere in the cloud. In the future, we don't know where it's gonna be either. Cloud may not be the way uh, 10, 20 years down the line. It may be some DNA storage mechanisms, who knows? Those things are changing. But one thing that doesn't really change very much is the representation. And historically, this is also true with our uh, religious texts. Okay, the representation of those things have not, the, the semantic content has not changed, all the interpretation has changed. All, but then, the, if you look at the persistency, initially they used to be uh, done on uh, clay tablets, then they went into you know, various kinds of uh, leaves, and from there they went into bark and, and, and then into paper, and then now in the computer. So once you store all this information, you have you have to can manipulate them, and that involves uh, search, mining the mining those uh, millions and millions of EHR records, and as a result, you can create knowledge. Knowledge can be created again using machine learning techniques. Again, since we are now talking about multiple systems here, because the entire ecosystem, as you have seen the uh, a slide before, where you have different actors playing different roles. And information is uh, our information and data are transferred between these various systems. You have need to have exchange, and this exchange involves both the syntactic and semantic interoperability. Uh, syntax. I'm just talking in English, I guess, with an accent, but uh, there's also some meaning associated with it. So that's the semantics, 
So we got to essentially exchange both syntax and semantics. And uh, you can see that uh, interoperability becomes a big issue. Um, so finally, security of information uh, is, is another thing that needs to be taken into consideration. So in terms of the NIST the healthcare, as I said, I'm the program manager of this NIST healthcare health IT program. We, we work on a number of projects and uh, I, I will update this slide with the URL uh, for this uh, particular uh, uh, website. So you can see all the projects that we're doing in terms of standards, interoperability, medical devices. We're doing a lot of neat things on that, uh, in body area networks and so on. So you can go into the website and look at it, biomedical imaging, bioinformatics, text retrieval and security. I'm not gonna go into all these things. I'm gonna concentrate on a few projects around here. So there was this nice article by Topal who also wrote a book uh, this is, I guess, came in nature something. And it talks about the, uh, the high performance uh, medicine. And it talks about how AI can be, uh, can, can, can be used in the medical field. And uh, he gives uh, a particular, this is a very nice article. I would, I would urge people to read through it. And he also wrote a, a book on it in the recent past. Uh, but there are a wide range of problems in the medical fields where AI can be used. Uh, for example, uh, when you're doing this, uh, the kind of cells that he shows around here, and uh, those cells, uh, uh, in, in, uh, are, uh, um, are generated in petri dishes, and one can do bioimaging on that and do an interpretation of what those really mean. Uh, then, when you have you, uh, you go to a particular doctor. Actually, this is a spelling error here. It's a diagnosis. Uh, when you go to a doctor. Uh, they, in terms of uh, 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 they, they your symptoms, and they come up with uh, he or she will come up with a diagnosis. And this again very interesting because a lot of times the doctors themselves miss certain diagnosis, and the AI systems can probably help because they can store enormous amount of knowledge. Like for example, the IBM Watson, uh, it can it can can process millions and millions of records, or both basically textbook knowledge and uh, expert knowledge. And they can also dig into New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, and all kinds of journals, and they can extract uh, knowledge from these kinds of things. Uh, and then when you are in a hospital, you are continuously, and especially with now, we can see in COVID patients, uh, they are, once they are admitted, and once they are on ventilators, they have to be monitored constantly. And you can also do control on uh, controlling the level of oxygen. And in, when you are in a uh, operating system, operating room, there are uh, lots of... Uh, uh, devices which are attached to you, and one has to control, uh, especially if you're an anesthesiologist, you know how important control is. Uh, then you have, uh, especially in oncology, and so on, your treatment planning, uh, that, uh, that again is a knowledge-based and an AI-intensive. And finally, we have, actually, the design involves in many activities, uh, even the design of hospitals, but drug design is an important thing now, especially with COVID-19, where people are trying to come up with new drugs uh, based on some old, uh, based on some, uh, uh, searching uh, old databases and seeing how we can combine bits and pieces of the old drugs into a new drug. So now I'm going to go in the next half an hour or so and discuss the history of AI from the first wave until what is happening right now. Uh, really, the first wave of AI was predicated on this thing called knowledge-based expert systems, where you have some kind of an architecture like this, uh, you have a knowledge base which consists of the knowledge of a particular domain. Uh, you can take the expert's knowledge, the knowledge of, the, of a medical expert into that. And, it's, and, and, it, and the knowledge can be represented in various formats like rules, frames, logic, semantic networks, and so on, uh, they, because they consist, consist of different kinds of knowledge uh, units, and not only if-then-else kind of rules, but also how particular or nodes are connected to other nodes and what are the relationship between these nodes. Then you have a short-term memory where depending on what is happening in the current context of the situation, uh, the rule, after the rule fires, the rule will kind of put some information into this context, just like your short-term memory. Then there are various inference mechanisms like forward chaining, backward chaining, chain propagation, hierarchical generate tests, which are used uh, based on the context and finding the appropriate rules, these inference engines are the ones which do that. And then, uh, uh, you know, they added a few other things like knowledge acquisition facility and expl explanation facility modules into the thing, so the system should be able to explain things. 
So in terms of the early, early history of artificial intelligence in medicine, there is this nice book on AI in medicine. And I think you, you, can, get a, you can get this book on the, on the web. If you Google it, you can find a PDF version, which kind of explains the activity which happened in the late 70s and the early 80s. Rutgers University used the knowledge representation mechanism called causal networks. The domain was glaucoma, and the system was called CASNET. And it became a domain uh, independent system uh, I said expert is the name of that. Then we have Ted Shortliff and other people at uh, Stanford who worked on this uh, groundbreaking work called Mycin, uh, which is a real rule-based expert system for infectious uh, diseases. And uh, uh, that actually uh, propelled uh, AI into uh, limelight to a certain extent. And, and uh, MIT and other people are working on this system called ANNA, uh, and uh, they had, uh, in terms of knowledge representation, concepts and rules, and they used on uh, a number of domains, including acid-based, electrolytes, and so on. Then University of Pittsburgh, uh, the first was Rutgers did uh, CASNET, and Pittsburgh did this thing called Internest. Uh, the domain independent system was called Cadacious. And uh, this had actually a very, very sophisticated system. Harry Popel did that, causal networks and ontologies. I think MIT, Peter Solovitz was leading the program. And uh, so you can see those people recorded in that uh, AI in medicine book. So it's a must for anyone who's interested in AI in medicine. So this uh, uh, machine is the one which is the pioneering system uh, in, uh, 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 in this uh, is a first system. And what you do is that, as you can see, I don't know how, how much you can see on the screen, uh, the system kind of uh, uh, asks you a number of questions, uh, like, for example, uh, where was the culture taken? And, uh, uh, and then it could ask, what is the suspected portal of entry, like the GI system? And you're talking about, is a burn, burn patient or not? And so on. So it asks a number of questions. And uh, once it asks all this question, so this is, a, this is the interaction with mycin. Uh, then uh, then uh, it, it takes the information, puts it into the short-term memory, that's a context, and then it uses a number of rules. It uses something called a backward chaining, uh, mostly backward chaining. They may use some forward chaining in there. And this, uh, and you can see the rules in mycin, whereas here you say if the identity of the organism is not known with some certainty and the stain of the organism is some gram-negative, the morphology is raw, and then the aerobicity is uh, aerobic, then there's a strongly suggestive evidence that the organism is uh, enterobacteria K. So then, based on this, you have another rule, which goes and uh, fires. So similarly, all these rules are keeps uh, firing. And like, for example, there's a rule 60 there, which says if the identity, identity of the organism is something, uh, bacteroids, then uh, the therapy is recommended with appropriate probabilities or certainties. And it says these are all the medicines that you take, uh, clindamycin, uh, chloro, I think it's uh, chloromifidicol, erythromycin, tetracycline, and so on. So that's what uh, it, 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 it does. So, but basically what happens is, depending on the information in you, in the context, appropriate rules are fired and suggestions are made. And one of the things that mycin did uh, very well uh, with, uh, after uh, 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 Ted Shortlift did his PhD, uh, Scott Clancy and other people joined the program. Uh, sorry, Scott and uh, William Clancy, they joined the uh, uh, PhD students. And uh, they kind of did this work on uh, developing explanations where you can ask why. You can say, because this, sometimes the, uh, the system is asking you questions, is organism one hospital-acquired infection? And you want to know why it's asking that question, and it will give you an answer. Uh, so, so many times, uh, it'll, it'll ask, it'll also, you want to know how. So how is it established that uh, the aerobicity of the organism is something? So then uh, the system says, okay, this particular rule was, uh, uh, these are the rules that have been used. So you can trace, you can trace your reason. And that's what DMICIN was very good at. Uh, so when you do this uh, uh, rule-based systems, tracing is, uh, is reasonably easy to do. And uh, EMICIN, uh, uh, actually the, you know, the, 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 the mycin and the extensions laid the foundation for that. Uh, so oh, I'm sorry, I did miss that uh, previous slide. So this, this is the one which talks about uh, explaining the uh, rules. Uh, then uh, the, that, was the, well, that was what was the first uh, revolution of the first wave. Then we had the uh, second wave, which is the 
uh, neural networks. We will talk about that briefly. So then we have this whole notion called artificial intelligence. And in the field of artificial intelligence, we have machine learning and a bit, I a bit we talked about knowledge-based systems. And uh, normally knowledge-based systems, people don't show like this, but I'm showing it because uh, there's a lot of uh, learning systems which use, make extensive use of knowledge networks. Then uh, that's also in machine learning. Uh, in machine learning, there are several types of machine learning techniques and popular techniques right now are the neural networks and the deep learning are the deep neural networks. So the, uh, there are models, these are some learning models based on extracted features. Uh, which are mostly, uh, as I talked about, uh, symbolic in nature. Uh, you do uh, kind of extract the appropriate features and act on them. And there are things like neural networks, which really act on models of raw data. So if you go back to the previous slide, you can see that neural networks are the ones which act in this, uh, uh, which are the ones in the bottom part of it, they act on raw data. And then what happened in the neural networks is that initially there used to be three layer networks. Like when I was working in the early 1980s, the networks which are popular were these uh, three-layer networks. And then as a computer hardware became cheaper and cheaper and uh, more complex, uh, people did this uh, multiple uh, layers in there. They're called multi-layer perceptron models. And then from there, you got this notion of convolution networks where uh, uh, data is abstracted and then into some features and reasoning is made on them. Well, that's the current trend, convolution neural networks. So in uh, at NIST, we do a lot of work on medical imaging, and I'll show some examples uh, of these things uh, through these medical imaging things. So the two projects I'll briefly describe, although we're doing a number of those projects, which I don't want to get into details. But, uh, but I, will, uh, uh, I will talk about now uh, on uh, these uh, two projects, images to diagnosis through ontologies, and then I'll talk about computational metrology for bioimaging. So for, for this thing, for uh, if you uh, go to the gastroenterolog or a gastroenterologist, I don't know how many of you must have gone through this thing. Like if you have heartburn and things like that, they do what is known as endoscopes, where they put a tube in your mouth. And uh, similarly, for uh, many people who are uh, 50 and above, they do this thing called colonoscopy, where they put something from the bottom, and uh, you know they do the they take this colonoscope and look and uh, look through the uh, Vector. So then finally, we have this thing called uh, uh, the, in the, small, uh, the small intestine. And the problem is you cannot put any, any, any of these tubes in there. So for that, someone came up with this idea called uh, pill cap. I don't know whether uh, this will, sh unfortunately, it's not, it's not going to show the video there because I don't think the video is, uh, uh, I can show it on my seat on my computer, but it doesn't show it. Essentially, it's a pill where which you can swallow and it takes photographs, and that's a kind of a pill. You swallow it, and the pill comes out. And uh, it takes uh, pictures of your entire system from the time you swallow it until the time it comes out, but more so on the small intestine. And uh, one of the things, uh, it takes uh, images like, like this, which doesn't really make sense. Uh, but uh, however, uh, what you can, the expert looks at those images, and expert can say what are the potential problems. So what we have done is that this is a long time ago. We could do we could segment segment the thing here, and the doctors can point out that this particular like you see the thing on green and say well you know that is a region of interest and this is what it is. And finally they come to a conclusion what kind of a problem you have there. And uh, so you kind of get this some features vectors and you map that into some kind of a diagnosis. So how do you do that? You do with that with something called this ontologies. So what you do is that you take these feature vectors, which are really uh, numerical values, and you move the numerical values into uh, these symbolic uh, things. Like, for example, uh, here uh, you have a, uh, a small ontology of the, of the GI system. And finally, you can use these ontologies, and you can say uh, you, you can map that feature. Like, for example, here you have a called Crohn's disease. And Crohn's disease is a kind of idiopathic inflammatory bowel disease. Finally, you have ulcerative colitis, uh, which is also a kind of idiopathic inflammatory disease. And you have, you can see some features there, which we extract from the previous one, and you can map on that. So what it will do is it will help the doctors do diagnosis automatically. So what? So once you get the uh, videos out of this uh, uh, cam, you take the videos and you can do an analysis of this video and you can determine exactly at what location in your small intestine there's a potential of this Crohn's disease 
and so on. And right now, I think this is 10 years old. Technology has developed quite a lot in this thing. Uh, it's, it's very hard to, for this bill to go through the large intestine for various reasons, but small intestine is pretty good. Then uh, we have been working on, uh, that is for the healthcare part of it. We have also been doing a lot of work on the uh, imaging aspects of things. So I'm going to briefly uh, right now on the, I'm sorry, I just missed the slides. The, this slide is the one which talks about the uh, idiopathic inflammatory bowel disease one. And now I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, which we talk about the computational metrology for biomedical imaging. So as you can see here, uh, there are two things. The images are taken. The, the, there are two aspects of it, the biological metrology and the computational science part of it. And what you do is this is microscopes take the images of uh, cells in, let's say, petri dishes. And once you take the images, then uh, because these um, actually... You can, if you look at these microscopes, uh, they scan through this uh, Petri dish. When you scan through the Petri dish, you can only take, if you want high intensity images, you can only take a small part of it. And then you can stitch, you stitch this over time. And that's how, like for example, for those of you who take panoramic photographs, that's what you do. You're doing a stitching part of it. And we do the stitching. And once you do the stitching, then uh, we do some, uh, we send the stitching back to the biologist who look at it and they kind of tell us what parts are important. They do the segmentation and those kinds of things. And uh, they tell us uh, that this part, uh, like for example, in the colonoscopy case, you have seen those uh, uh, features that are uh, determined by the doctor. Similarly, the biologists will tell us the features and they send it back to us and our machine learning algorithms will actually learn these features. And then we send it back to them and they say, yeah, is this what it is? They say, okay. So then the process goes on and on. And so as a result of that, what happens is we get complete confidence in, in the whole uh, technique in terms of uh, uh, determining which particular, uh, what is happening in this Petri dish. Let's put it that way for the time being. Okay. So when one of the examples around here is this uh, age-related macular degeneration, uh, where, uh, for example, uh, if you see many people uh, have this macular degeneration, especially when they grow old, and there is actually a gene, the macular degeneration gene, which uh, some of us have. Uh, and what happens is that uh, the vision, if you look at the top part of it, that's what, uh, if you have macular degeneration, that's what the vision is. But then we want a 2020 vision. So for that, what they do is that they take, uh, there are about 11 million people in the US suffering from this kind of thing right now. So what you do is that we take the blood out of that particular patient's and then we then grow pluripotent stem cells around here. And the stem cell colonies are grown over six to nine months. And at the same time, we're taking images of that. And not all of those images are, uh, are, are taken. And not all of the stem cell colonies can be inserted back into the human uh, eye. Only So our system predicts which are the potentially good stem cells. And then you can take those stem cells and, uh, and put that in your eye. Uh, so this process you know, takes about a year or so, and then it generates an enormous amount of data to the order of petabytes of data. So we have a system where you can, uh, uh, there's a lot of issues in terms of this scale, this complexity, this speed. So this system called WIPP, and you can see the website for it, it does uh, processing both at the server level and the web level, where you can look at these images and uh, you can do uh, and we do uh, using, uh, uh, the, there are shades like uh, 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 colors where you can see cutting, stitching, and repopulation. These are domain independent, kind of context independent, and segmentation, tracking, and prediction model, uh, modeling are context dependent, depending on what case study you're doing right now. You got to change those algorithms appropriately. But in this system, uses the, it uses the neural networks for doing all the machine learning kind of things. And, and what the system does, is that uh, you can go in and analyze even only parts of the thing too on, on your uh, browser, or you can do on the server very complex analysis. And this system, I think the software is available at WAPP. So it uses essentially neural networks to do the feature extraction. It, it uses neural networks to determine, for example, which is a good stem cell co um, colony that you can use to uh, which, which particular colony will become a good uh, colony rather than a bad colony. You can do implantations based on that. 
uh, I'm, I have about 15 minutes, I'm gonna go faster here. And uh, we use things like generative ad adverse cells. Some, sometimes what happens is we cannot, actually we don't have enough data for generating for, for images, enough image data. So we use uh, GANs to generate uh, uh, example images, generative adverse cell neural networks. Uh, then uh, the other thing we do is that we generate uh, rules uh, from neural networks. So one of the problems with neural networks is they don't explain things. We generate rules for net, uh, uh, rules for these neural networks. And this is a project with Peter Bacci, Mary Brady, and other people did. Uh, what what they've done is this this thing called Raman microspectroscopy. And uh, what you can do with that is that you can go in and uh, determine in a particular cell uh, where is the nucleus, what is the cytosol, and so on. So once, uh, how do you determine that automatically is the key question. So this particular project uses this uh, uh, Raman, uh, Raman microspectroscopy and the spectrum lines you can see here, I, I don't know whether you can see on the, uh, me moving my mouse here, but you can see uh, there's a wave-like thing there. And uh, then what you do is that the spectrum, uh, from the spectra, we can generate appropriate rules. We can extract rules using this uh, neural networks, uh, uh, using a mechanism, which is in the paper uh, which, uh, which Peter and Tal wrote. And so what you can do right now is that the experts actually tell us that uh, you know, based on if the spectrum has certain characteristics, like for example, C1, which says minus one times, uh, this is a particular uh, peak that you are seeing there, 2855, what is the uh, value at this particular, uh, I have to go back to the spectrum anyway. Uh, so there's a function X of that particular num num number, you have the frequency or whatever it is, what's the number there? So the expert says if it's greater than two, then it's a nucleus. And the system kind of uses that and generates the C2 and C, uh, it generates uh, uh, using neural networks several C1, C2, and C3, because what the C1, C2, C3 says is that there's no single way of clarification. There are several ways of classifying this to be a nucleus. Similarly, the experts has three ways of doing it. The system also has three ways, and it shows that if you use two neural networks, you get more confidence. Essentially, you're generating rules from the neural network, and you can see this is for lipids. That was for the nucleus, and this is for the lipids. And then uh, Bachi and other people, they have looked into several uh, schemes for evaluating neural networks. And that's another important thing that we do. We do testing and evaluating in NIST. In this case, you, you want to know what is the neural network technique that you can use. There are several technique approaches that you can use for this uh, determining, for example, uh, which is a good uh, cell implant, like in that uh, uh, epithelial cells that you have seen, uh, which are the ones which are good. So we have several approaches here that you can go. You can first use neural networks and then gen some features and then use traditional algorithms for regression and classification on them, or you can do it directly, or you can just use directly on the uh, on the images, uh, create some uh, features from there, and then do this like, regression analysis, So, which is a good one. Now, there's a problem. The problem is that we don't know which is the best of the lot, because although you can see in this case that uh, one of the approaches, which is using neural networks, is uh, on the image directly is pretty good, Unfortunately, it's very bad in terms of explaining why it does what it does. On the other hand, there is another one which is uh, uh, where, where you have seen an example where you extract the features, and that's pretty good. But then in terms of accuracy, uh, not only accuracy in terms of the speed and things like that, this is not that great as this particular one. Okay, There's a lot of trade-offs, but they all seem to be doing reasonably good anyway. So you'll have to do that. And people are using this uh, in February when I looked at it, when the coronavirus was just about coming, and I saw this thing where the virus predicted that uh, this, uh, that AI, sorry, AI predicted uh, that uh, you can use uh, the AtaZenavir, which is a uh, medicine which is used for HIV, viral, antiviral medicine used for HIV, can also be used for corona. Coronavirus is vulnerable for that. That's what they did. So this was about six months ago. So then uh, again, I have about 10 minutes. I'm going to go through this a uh, little bit, uh, talk about the third wave. So what's happening is this neural networks can be fooled to a certain extent. And here is an example where the neural network was trained to learn about uh, the guitar and penguin, but then uh, it can be fooled into thinking that uh, uh, these two images which are shown here uh, are uh, a guitar and a penguin with 99.99% accuracy. So one of the so as a result of that, so we have to have some combination of neural networks that you have seen along with the knowledge networks, which I talked about previously. 
So there's a program called the Open Knowledge Network Program, which uh, they were, the idea is to talk about, uh, uh, is to develop these uh, uh, representations for, uh, for, for encoding knowledge in networks. So this is the vision of that, and you go to the NSF uh, NITRD.gov site and see what the vision of this uh, open knowledge network is all about. So essentially, it's an idea is to develop uh, uh, huge knowledge networks of uh, nodes with semantics uh, associated with uh, labels. So the, there were a lot of representative teams we can do with it, and uh, ontologies are a way to represent that. And there's a spectrum called ontology spectrum. Again, uh, there is, uh, if you Google ontology or uh, summit, you can see all these things, uh, slides are available there. And we are working on something called category theory, where we can do multiple representations in there. And uh, so to generate this ontology, how do you generate this ontologies automatically? For that, uh, we have developed a system uh, based on, uh, uh, again, I'm running out of time around here, uh, which is uh, based on uh, a grammar, which a gentleman called Panini developed for Sanskrit. Using that particular grammar, uh, Panini's grammar and Panini's technique, uh, we can actually develop this compound noun, noun, noun uh, uh, words from text. So here, uh, there is a particular phrase you can take uh, is in an initial frame of reference and convert it, convert it to initial reference frame. So we can condense, the, we can scan the text and take this, uh, uh, these sentences or these phrases like this and come up with uh, certain noun, noun, noun combinations and now we can do verbs also in there. So what can you use this? You can use this for searches. So if you can go, if you go to the website, like for example, uh, the uh, COVID, uh, we have used this uh, to, uh, this is again publicly available. Uh, there's a COVID data repository. So if you go to the NIST website uh, and uh, type uh, the COVID repository, I just Google COVID repository, you'll get this. And this particular repository actually has about 190,000 articles which have been curated. And then you can search through these articles to find out uh, you know, appropriate uh, pieces of uh, 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 the article, relevant articles. For example, here I say virus and, up and, and virus and immunity. It kind of gives you, guides you through this process where, you, where it says, well, do you really want, you may want virus specific immunity and so on. And once you do that, it'll tell you these are all the papers which are associated with that, which is in this uh, uh, things which are relevant to this, like uh, viral gastroenteritis in the, other, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, yeah, in the adult population. So that's how we do. And then you can create taxonomies based on, that is for searching. Then you can do taxonomies, like for example, here uh, we looked at the diabetes text, and here is a taxonomy that it created on the diabetes patient, where you have, uh, uh, melitis diabetes patient and then malnutrition melitis diabetes patient. So it automatically generates all these taxonomies. Finally, we are working on something called uh, predictive coding, and this is based on in cognitive systems. So how do you combine all these things? Now you have neural networks, you have uh, things like category theory, uh, knowledge networks, and those kinds of things. How do you combine on? So they, because the Open knowledge networks have some advantages. The neural networks have some advantages and weaknesses. For example, OKN is not very good at dealing with unstructured data. It is very good at dealing with structured data. On the other hand, neural networks is very good at identifying these patterns. Uh, neural networks uh, takes uh, a lot of time for training data. It requires thousands and thousands of millions of uh, uh, samples. Whereas if you have uh, background knowledge, you can do common sense kind of knowledge. You can do complex uh, logic with OKN, and uh, neural networks are very bad at explanation. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, you can do some online learning on neural networks, and it's a little bit harder on the, uh, to elicit knowledge is not that easy, but you can do that. But uh, whereas here, uh, you, can, you can formulate uh, some classification structures. So for this, what we have is something called the predictive coding, and uh, it's a technique which is being developed in the cognitive science area and Spencer Briner is working on that. And what he does is that he kind of takes, uh, I'm gonna show you one little example here, how this works, is that uh, there are two terminologies around here, which is the one uh, which estimates the environmental variables. Environmental variables are like the concepts in your head, like a diabetes is an environmental variable in your head. 
and how diabetes is created in terms of by the insulin and so on, the whole pathway, or in, when I talked about the uh, HPV pathway and all those things are the environmental variables. And then, then you have this uh, uh, sensory perceptions which come, which is uh, like, for example, uh, the data from which comes through your eyes, nose, ear, all the sensory perceptions that you can, and that's the main data around here. So what you do is that you can take this uh, open knowledge networks, uh, which, is the, which is this particular R function, along with this G function, which are the environmental variables, that is your concept here, you saw the neural network example, given this particular data, then you can create an estimate of what it should be. Then based on this, what you have is you have the actual reality of what you have seen, and then you have a, uh, what the system predicts, and there's a prediction error. And one of the ways the human beings learn is that there is prediction error, and this system will help you to do that. So, so we're combining a number of technologies. We are, we are very preliminary work has been done, not much. Okay, so what I would suggest is for you to kind of look at this particular article, which I got it from NCBI. Now, this particular text is, is kind of important. Why is it important? So if you read that, that this, are now, this is how a lot of journals, like if you go to New England Journal of, uh, uh, what's it, New England Medical Journal, uh, or uh, actually I have a copy of that here. This is, the, this, this, is, this is the journal, New England Journal of Medicine. And if you scan, through this thing, or you can scan American Journal of Medicine, or any one of these, if you scan those things, you'll see things like uh, what I've shown there, okay? So take a minute and read that, uh, that particular part there, and what it really shows, it says that there was a 55-year-old male who was admitted to the hospital with some history of abdominal pain, dissension, constipation, and vomiting for the last six to seven days, eight days. Now what happened is previously they've done some investigation and uh, they did this colonoscopy and things like that, and it was not suggestive of Crohn's disease, okay? Then uh, they did this, uh, uh, they did a little more analysis, and they found out that uh, when they did that analysis and they did this histopathological examination of the specimen, and it showed some uh, enlarged uh, lymphatic follicles. And uh, so based on this, they kind of came up with it, well, you know, yeah, this is a diagnosis of Crohn's disease. So the idea now here, what is the thing? Here you can see there's a lot of symbolic kind of knowledge, which is a lot of items that, for example, uh, there's a chronoscopy, that's a term, Crohn's disease. Remember that the Crohn's disease we talked about, that's a term. Uh, so then you have images, like the one you see in the bottom left corner. Those kinds of images have to be interpreted. So neural networks and those kinds of things come into picture. So there's a lot of things happening in this simple um, uh, page that a lot of knowledge uh, activities are taking place, neural networks, knowledge networks, all of them, and that is what the future of uh, me uh, medical diagnosis is going to be. So now I've kind of a little bit run out of time. I just wanted to talk briefly about uh, 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 the DARPA XAI. Essentially, what this XAI program is uh, looking at is that you have all these uh, techniques. Remember, we had techniques uh, uh, such as neural networks, deep learnings, and the techniques like decision trees, uh, which are more symbolic in nature, and the classification trees. And now what happens around here is that if you try to explain things, uh, these deep learning systems are very good at, uh, I mean, certain tasks, like diagnosis tasks, uh, classification tasks, sorry, classification tasks, they're very good, uh, but however, they're not able to explain. Whereas decision trees can explain, but they're not as efficient in terms of uh, learning performance. So the DARPA program is, uh, uh, there's a website for that. You can Google and find out. And they're trying to come up with mechanisms where uh, it's called Explanation AI. And there's a whole lot of papers and things published on that. And they want to see how you can uh, generate uh, this learning function here. There's a learn function. How can you explain this learn function? Instead of, if you ask questions like uh, why you did that currently, you can do that. But once this thing is in place, then you can say, understand why you made that particular diagnosis of Crohn's disease. So uh, in terms of brief summary, so we do uh, metrology for AI and AI for metrology. That's what uh, NIST is all about. And uh, we do a lot of work, a lot of standards, and introduced at the right time, we lead to innovation. So there's a lot of tests. All these algorithms that have been developed, whether they're knowledge networks or the neural networks, have to be tested. And testing will increase the trust in artificial intelligence, increase the trust in decision-making in medicine. OK? And uh, now. Uh, there is uh, this whole notion of uh, uh, 
you can see now if you go go through the uh, web and if you want to search, uh, you will see all kinds of things happening. I did this a couple of days ago. How our AI and machine learning are helping to find COVID. So you can do Google on that, and you can see tons of articles coming up on how artificial intelligence is helping in the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, I'm going to skip the rest of the slides. This says how we are going to describe the health person, persona, and so on. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip these things. Uh, this essentially talks about the future environment where uh, human beings are uh, instrumented completely, and, uh, and the environment uh, is constantly this is looking your your uh, devices on you are constantly looking at the environment and based on your personal health records it's going to make decision and there's a rule based system here this asthma case uh, it says that if uh, if the environmental variables are not very good and if you're prone to asthma then you have a problem there in that particular location so in the future we're going to have the smart devices smart networks smart processes smart electronic medical records everything is going to be smart and you also go to the grocery store you can get smart water so we're going to be pretty smart. So this is how a 21st century doc will look like uh, in your house. This, uh, you know, as I said, the houses will be fully instrumented. Uh, and this was a talk I gave at NIH about eight years ago, saying how this, and the, and the talk's theme is very similar to what I'm saying right now. And uh, the claim is that with the data devices and networks and how they promote smarter healthcare. And uh, I'm going to accept that what I'm claiming right now is we are in something called the seventh paradigm of medical care. And this seventh paradigm is where devices are connected to human beings, and you're going to have, uh, and then you seamlessly data is being, data is generated, seamlessly interoperate with everything, and then you can see decision being made, and the doctor medicine is at the point of care. So with the seventh, seventh paradigm, you will have P7 and slash P9 medicine actually happening. And uh, this talk is based essentially uh, by work at several people at NIST, and I try to provide credit as much as possible in the slides. And there's a disclaimer that whatever commercial equipment and software uh, that uh, that has been identified, we are uh, we don't endorse anything. We are a government agency. Uh, and uh, I know I went through a lot of slides, and these slides will be available. And basically, the summary is that AI is going to have a big impact in the future of healthcare. Thank you again. Uh, Kerry, I'm going to turn it over to you now. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sriram. That was a great uh, presentation. Uh, one thing I do want to say is that I've had the smart water, and it's not that smart. It seems pretty much like every other water to me. <laughs> wait, 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 put some nanoparticles in there and sell it to you, and it will go into your system and, 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 and all kinds of things it will monitor. But there's a <laughs> That's good. We, we do have some questions here that I'd like to give you from the audience. Um, the first question I have came early in the uh, presentation. It was, what are the recommendations for AI in healthcare? Uh, I mean, what do you mean by recommendations is the, is the key issue. So as I mentioned, that uh, AI is going to play a major part in different aspects of healthcare. I showed you the problems, the diagnosis. We're going to see AI. Monitoring, we're going to see monitoring the patients, we're going to see AI. So we're going to see AI at different stages of care, not at a single point. And depending on what stage you are, in what context you are, you have to use the appropriate technologies or techniques. Thank you. This next person asks, is MYCIN used today clinically? Mycin is not really used, but offshoots of mycin probably used. There was a commercial called Iliad, which was developed a long time ago. So, and in fact, if you look very carefully at IBM Watson, there are bits and pieces of the Mycin framework. So a lot of times what happens is in technology, you develop the concepts and you move on. And those concepts are, 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 are incorporated in other systems. So we can't really say whether Mycin is used in its way, in, in exactly in its original incarnation, but I believe they, it had taught a lot to the people. So people have learned from that experience and built other systems. Very good. Uh, this next person asks, in the case of disease diagnosis using AI, what are the key points to be kept in mind in terms of AI model performance? Yeah, so that's a good question because what happens is that when you use AI for diagnosis, how do you trust this? How do you trust 
what the system is giving you is the right thing. And that's that uh, will have to do, there are a couple of issues in there. One is there's also bias involved in AI because in many systems, what happens is that these neural network systems are trained with a particular group, uh, with the images with a particular group, but then when you apply it for a different uh, 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 demographics, then this may not be applicable, okay? Like for example, if you develop a, an AI system in the United States and try to apply in India, it may not be applicable as such. So similarly, so people uh, the, in India, they should develop their own things. And then actually there's a lot of things at IISC uh, and IITs, the, the people are developing and there's a thing called IIIT. A number of places in India, for example, they're doing uh, local systems are being uh, developed. And in terms of the medical diagnosis, I mean, you have to use it not as the ultimate scene right now, but rather as an augmented system. I wouldn't replace the doctor with, with this. Although for the, in radiology, to a certain extent, you can the systems are reasonably good. They're doing the diagnosis reasonably good, but I still wouldn't replace the doctor because that human element is extremely important. And then, and, but then the systems can be useful. Like for example, if you are in a rural area, like, like uh, uh, rural Alabama, uh, maybe in rural Andhra Pradesh in India. So uh, if you do this, where, if you are in those places, what happens is there's no care even not available at the state. So if you have some systems there doing preliminary diagnosis and uh, preliminary things in terms of telemedicine, which is going to grow in the future, uh, you can see how the systems can help in the initial stages. But then you can get an expert into the picture later on. Yeah. So I wouldn't replace the doctor at this stage, but I would. But this will aid the doctors. And here is an example. Uh, like for those of you who read Washington Post around here on Tuesdays, uh, you have uh, medical mysteries, or you can Google there. And some of those medical mysteries, doctors miss the diagnosis uh, for years and years. Okay. So there are systems like this can help you. That like if someone comes with some strange symptoms, like I have arthritis, for example, and also have GI problems, what is the diagnosis around here? Uh, my flare-ups, then only when I have certain kinds of foods, my thing is my GI, uh, I'm having uh, irritable ball syndrome. So that is flaming up. So what do you do in that case? So this, this kind of uh, knowledge basis, like uh, Washington's uh, post is uh, medical mysteries, and if someone uh, makes that a knowledge-based uh, system, uh, you can uh, go and ask query, saying that hey, given these particular symptoms, have you seen anything similar to that? So that will really help the doctor to do much, much better diagnosis. Thank you. This next person uh, wants to know when the doctors are using AI for healthcare, how much AI do they really need to know? They, at, at the moment, they don't seem to know much about AI. Uh, many of you don't need to know anything, personally. They should be aware of it, but most of them can get knowledge in you know, these kinds of uh, 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 Abstract knowledge is available. They probably see the news and things like that. So that's that's okay. You don't really be an expert in AI or any such thing. The system, even now, for example, doctors use a lot of like EKG. Uh, they take the EKG and a lot of uh, uh, internists. The system kind of tells them, you know, yeah, you know, they might have an atrial fibrillation or something like that. Uh, but uh, they uh, they don't really need to know uh, very specific details of why it's atrial fibrillation. They only the expert. Cardiologists may want to, may, may, may need to know that. So it will provide you, it will help the doctors in giving them expertise, which is not easily gotten. Okay, very good. This next person goes back to the Mycin discussion. Uh, is there more future work on Mycin that can be done? Uh, actually, that's a good question because you probably need to talk to Ted shortly for another people. Uh, who developed this uh, thing originally, uh, but uh, uh, there's a lot of work to be done in encoding the knowledge. That's what the open knowledge networks is all about. Yes, the answer is yes. And then combining the open knowledge networks with neural networks. So may, not exactly like mycin, like mycin like systems with augmenting with knowledge networks and neural networks. Mycin per se, maybe not, but uh, you know, based on mycin, you can do that. Because a lot of problems, what happens is that some of the systems are very brittle. If they don't have the knowledge, they won't answer. They just fail. So it, it's all knowledge Thank intensive. You. And with neural, adding neural networks to it, it will help you to, uh, uh, to uh, level that. 
Okay, this next person is asking, uh, it looks like about ethics. Um, AI and medicine require specific focus on ethics, even exclusively. As a combination and with personal and private information slash data thrown in, ethics becomes even more important. Shouldn't AI for medicine be ethical by design? Do you think there's enough focus on this aspect today among researchers in any of these fields, AI, data analytics, or healthcare tech? Yeah, so again, uh, that is a good question because uh, one of the major, they should be by design, you should add ethics into the thing. That is the people who are not doing that should take that into consideration. Uh, but again, uh, uh, progress uh, is in incremental steps in some sense. Okay? So all the people can claim, you know, suddenly happen. that's not true. Like, as someone said, we stand on the shoulders of giants. So progress happens over the years and decades. So right now, ethics is becoming a very important issue. And there are, if you go to the AAAI conferences, there are old sessions on AI and ethics, not only in the medical field, but in other fields too. And there's a bias involved in there. Uh, and you can see that in uh, many of the conferences, uh, people who are specialists in ethics and AI talking about it. So if you Google AI and ethics, you can find a number of these articles. So, and bias, ethics, privacy, that's why I had P9, protection and uh, privacy are important part of it. So it's protection is not only safety of the medical devices, but also you have to protect the patient with other things in terms of bias and ethics and those kinds of things. Okay, very good. The next person asks, should we use histopathology with XAI? What? Histopathology? Uh, let me, yes, let me no, read it. it again. Should we use histopathology with XAI? No, no, histopathology, the pathology is just histopathology, but then the AI systems will help uh, looking at the images and uh, will uh, you know, determine uh, and extract the features of interest and potential diagnosis. Uh, but uh, you know, AI can help that. And the only thing is that the explanation AI will tell you why that particular person has made that diagnosis. So yeah, I mean, you, you need XAI for if you want those kinds of things. That's why it becomes important in the medical field. This one's a bit broad. It might have been covered. Um, the person says, are there any unique advantages of AI in healthcare? Well, it's not a question of unique advantages. It's a question of technology. AI is a technology, and uh, it has to be used properly, that's all. I mean, obviously, it will help uh, our future healthcare vision. And uh, there are bits and pieces of, the, of AI in many of the systems right now. And if you look at Apple, Google, and all of them, they are using... Uh, Microsoft, they, many of them are using uh, AI within their uh, systems. So, yes, the answer is yes. AI is going to have a lot of benefits for healthcare. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about this. All right, very good. The next person says all AI systems are not real time systems as they undergo offline training. How is it possible to make these AI systems? It turn them into real a real time AI systems. Well, that is a uh, field by itself, real time AI, and uh, some activities. At one time, there's a lot of activity going on. But if you look at uh, the operating system of the future, uh, this gentleman Julian Goldman at uh, uh, at Mass General, uh, he's doing a number of these things in this area. Where, like, uh, if you look in the, he's an anesthesiologist, and their uh, AI has to be real time. Because uh, you know the patient is on the table, and you are, you know, the, uh, inducing anesthesia, and uh, all kinds of uh, instruments are there. They're talking to one another, and you have the signals on the on your displays, and you have to, and, and, and AI systems should look at that and make sure that nothing is going to go wrong. And that is real time AI. And there's real time AI also on the battlefield. If you look at it, there's defense defense uh, people are doing some work in that uh, real time AI in the battlefield. Okay, very good. The next person asks, um, the fourth point is preventative, yet one, an enterprise architecture is needed for food and drug safety that are imported from the world. Uh, commerce has this data. 
Um, from a geomedicine point of view, EPA has data regarding quality of the air and water. And three, the syndrome, syndromatic data can come from uh, okay. supermarkets, pharmacies, and social media. I guess that's more of a statement than a question. Well, the key question I think is uh, probably this, this lot of data, which are from different sources. So you have to do a fusion of this data. Then there's lots of things in there. It's not a simple question because the data are taken from a raw format and then you have to convert it down into uh, some formats, features or whatever format you want. And you can, uh, then that has to be incorporated into uh, your healthcare framework. Uh, and as the, as the gentleman pointed out, all these are very important for healthcare. So then you have this whole issue of interoperability of information coming from these different sources. And I don't think anyone is addressing that problem per se, but that's a good problem to address, but it has to come at a very high level. This next person uh, points at something you've stated, this, that uh, future AI would be conscious. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, that's a tough question because, as I said, that uh, the, in, uh, uh, he, he, there's something called the consciousness, okay? Uh, and the uh, uh, um, issue is that there's a lot of things that we do in a subconscious level, and that subconscious level will come to the conscious level at some point. And philosophers have been dealing with this issue for a long time. So in terms of the AI systems, can AI systems be conscious? Because if you have that robot, can that robot be conscious of its environment? Like when you have a patient who's in a coma, how do you know that? Is that the patient conscious? What do you mean by consciousness around there? Is he or she consciousness of the environment? Similar question we ask for the AI systems. And that's why Susan's book is a good book to look at and how we can achieve consciousness within the AI framework. Very good. The next person asks, is there experience with systems which continuously learn directly from diagnoses done by medical doctors? Uh, there are bits and pieces in the research area, but in the practical things, the answer is no. But uh, in the research environments, they are, and IBM is looking at their Watson to do something like that. So uh, there, there are activities going on, uh, but uh, I doubt very much there is something which actually is running right now. Although if you look at your uh, uh, Fitbit and those kinds of things that are the Apple Watch that I'm wearing, uh, it's constantly determining uh, what I'm doing and it, it is telling uh, me to go see a doctor and those kinds of things. So they, they are doing bits and pieces. Okay, the next one is there was a considerable research related to EHR in the first decade of the century. Today, not much discussion is happening on EHR, EMR, uh, it's not obsolete, of course, but what's the reason for seemingly re uh, reducing interest on these topics? No, there's not, not interest has not gone out of these topics. Uh, if you, if there is an organization in the United States called ONC, Office of the National Coordinator for Healthcare IT, you should go to their website. They got a lot of information of what is happening in EHRs. So the EH, what, what happened in the EHRs is that there was an act called the Tech Act and uh, there was about uh, $30 billion set aside for the doctors. Uh, there's something called the Meaningful uh, Use Incentive Program. And if the doctors participated and showed in a meaningful way that these EHRs are being used, they got some money from the government, anywhere between forty dollars to $60,000 over five years. And the government has spent approximately $30 billion on that already. And because of that, EHRs are being used a lot, about 80 to 90% of the United States uh, uh, medical uh, 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 doctors are uh, physicians or healthcare workers are using EHRs. And these EHRs, before they go into the, uh, before the doctors buys them and they get meaningful uh, use uh, incentive money, they have to be tested. And they're all tested using the test methods developed by NIST. And we have several people, Kevin Brady, John Gargillo, who actually are leading those, pro uh, led before and are leading those things right now, developing the test programs. And Rob Stanley wrote a book on that also. That area. So you can find all that when you go to the NIST website. You can find a whole lot of information on the test sets that we did. In fact, even if you took at the, look at the COVID-19, there's a syndromic surveillance, and the data goes from various hospitals and so on to CDC sites. And uh, uh, we actually do have developed the 
uh, test techniques to making ensure to making sure that that data are being transformed uh, in a uh, in a right manner. Thank so you. this is still working, audience. and there's a lot of stuff in data in terms of uh, data. Like for example, all these electronic health records, there is tremendous amount of knowledge hidden in there. So you can you can mine those and create new knowledge, and that's happening. Okay, thank you. The next audience member wants to know what the potential risks of AI and medicine are, and how could we address those? Oh boy, that's a tough one because uh, uh, there are always risks for using any technology, and so have a risk mitigation strategy for 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 AI, and that's in fact one of the things I think would be of interest for us in the future. What is your, like even for computer security? NIST has got its uh, computer security framework. For those of you who know that, and there is a risk mitigation strategy in there, use something like that in the future for AI too. The next one is, how can we rely on the explanation generated by GAN? It's finally generated. Can we use it uh, as is, or does it need to be validated? It has to be validated. If you want explanation. It's a, it depends on what you're using it for. A lot of times, they're just writing images and things like that. and. And those things are, you don't need that much validation sometimes, but for some areas, yes, you need it to be validated. The GAN itself has to be validated. And that's some of the things which NIST comes into picture. And also there's one more thing, which in terms of test data, so if you want to validate your GAN system, do you have a test data somewhere? And we don't really have databases of test data anywhere. Like for example, ImageNet uh, developed at uh, uh, Stanford, uh, that they have a huge uh, repository of images which can be used to test your algorithms. So similarly, we need uh, test data to test GANs and a whole lot of other things in AI in medicine. And hopefully, I don't know, NIST may or may not play a role in that depending on how the situation goes, but it's an important area, having test data. Okay, this next person asks, um, the HIPAA standard, is it enough for EHR? HIPAA standard is one of the standards, okay, that for, uh, for ensuring privacy, thing, but there's more to it. Okay, there's okay. more to, there are more things coming along down the line, okay. The next and, person is concerned about bias, and they wanna know, is there enough effort to remove bias in AI in healthcare? Ah, so there, there were a couple of uh, interesting articles which are coming in the recent past, one from University of Pennsylvania, uh, about uh, bias in healthcare. And I have the reference, but uh, I don't know. Uh, let me see if I can get to, uh, in terms of, uh, if you can give me one second. I can give you the name of the person you can Google and find out uh, uh, this gentleman, uh, uh, is uh, Ravi Parikh, R-A-V-I is the first name, Parikh is the last name. And uh, he, uh, he has uh, talked about addressing AI bias in healthcare. So he's written, pa he's written papers about that. And he's assistant professor of medical ethics and health policy, University of Pennsylvania. So if you Google R-A-V-I Ravi Parikh, P-A-R-I-K-H, and, and uh, he's at uh, Penn Medicine, upen.edu, so you can get uh, his address and so on. So he's, he's, he's one of the leading persons on looking at uh, artificial, uh, of addressing AI bias in healthcare. Okay. Um, it looks like this might be the last question we take. We are yeah. running out of time here. Um, yeah. How does a personal area network with sensors and key body parameters how should that be integrated into the AIHC interfaces? Yeah, I mean, that uh, that work is being done, and uh, there is uh, several, it's, like, answer to them can, can be quite long, because uh, we have uh, body area networks. Uh, there's a person, Kamran, uh, at uh, NIST uh, working in that area. So the body area networks, one of the problems with the body area networks is that when you put all these instruments on your body, they are generating electromagnetic uh, radiation, and they can interfere with other uh, 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 devices also. So how do you deal with these interactions? And then once you have this, you have all the data which is coming on, 
and that data has to be incorporated from uh, from the body onto your uh, uh, other net, uh, other networks. Okay, like that's why what happens is in the healthcare of the future, in your own home, you might be having this small uh, network, and that network has to interface with the global networks, and it also has to in, in interface with your doctor's network and so on. And and research is still being done in that area. It's a good question. You still have to do a lot of work. All right, very good. I think that's all we've got for today in terms of time. Um, I do want to thank you very much, Dr. Sriram, for your presentation. It was fantastic. We really enjoyed having you here. Um, I'd also like to thank all of those who are attending today. Uh, the next webinar in the Distinguished Lecture webinar series will be on July 30th at 6 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. It will be a panel discussion on computing lessons from COVID-19, which will be moderated by San Murugasan, and we'll have panelists including Stephen J. Andrioli, Sridhar Dine Dayalan, Dayan Miloicic, and Gandhi Sivakumar. Uh, this webinar will be co-sponsored by the STC on IT in Practice. In addition to the Distinguished Lecturer webinar series, we also offer the Build Your Career webinar series that focuses on business soft skills, such as communication and presentation skills, career transition, interviewing tips, among others. Our next Build Your Career webinar will be on the 20th of August at 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time on the online presenter by Elsa Velasco Paul, founder of the M&E Group. Registration is now open and we will be sending you a link to these future events along with slides and a recording of this webinar. Again, thank you very much to everybody and thank you very much, Dr. Sriram. This was a great presentation. We've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And thank you all for attending.